You pick this mine up, it goes off. You eat five pounds of explosives. Explosives in the human body don't get along. This ain't the war to be out there playing Rambo. Schwarzkopf's Vietnam experience, he'd been decorated for rescuing a soldier from a minefield, made him especially concerned to warn his men of the danger. I didn't realize he had so many types, but we knew that he had a lot of mines out there. They've got a pretty formidable minefield, but uh, we're not going to be stupid about it. We're not just going to send a human wave through this thing. He's got a lot of them from a lot of countries. Who let him get them, we don't know, but we're going to have to deal with them now. The highly effective Viper device was now on active service. There was one more effort to persuade Iraqi troops not to fight to the end. More leaflets were dropped advising surrender. The few who did surrender, dots on a desert horizon, were herded together by Chinook helicopters. Brigadier Christopher Hammerbeck led the British 4th Brigade in his tank, Nomad. Out on the western flank of the Allied positions, the desert rats linking with the 1st US Armoured Division thrust across the enemy's land, not into Kuwait as the Iraqis had expected, but northward into Iraq itself. Later, these tankies, as they called themselves, would wheel round, slicing across the north of Kuwait to trap as much of the occupying force as possible. The attack turned into a classic dash. Opposition was, in Schwarzkopf's own words, remarkably light. The British Army's new warrior fighting gear. Inside these battle taxis, as the men prefer to call them, the mechanized infantry prepared for their job. At its most severe, killing enemy soldiers in their foxholes with bayonet and grenade. We do we're killing on a personal basis. The guys at the top there are killing people from kilometers away. We have to get out and actually clear the places, obviously, the grenade, the rifle, and the bayonet, if need be. Does it worry you the thought of using the bayonet? Well, no, I've got loved ones back home and I want to get back to them as much as um, the rest of the guys, so I'm prepared to do anything to get back home. Another new piece of equipment, the multiple launch rocket system, capable of firing ripples of 12 rockets, each containing 644 bombs, to smash artillery positions and tanks. One Iraqi commander later reported that only seven of his 250 men survived such an attack. Not far behind, barrages from more conventional artillery. could catch anyone unawares.
The weather could still hamper the swiftest moves, just as it had with the air campaign of Operation Desert Storm. The commander of the 1st Armoured Division, Major General Rupert Smith, Bere and Spectacles, briefed his senior officers on the next decisive engagement at night with the Republican Guard. There'd been much talk before the ground assault about the Allies' night fighting superiority. Here, the equipment proved itself beyond all doubt. Enemy tanks were destroyed, often without return of fire. Most were usually dug in, pointing the wrong way. If Iraqi armor did get in a blow, their shells bounced off Allied tanks, causing, at worst, a slight dent. Daylight, and it was time to consult the maps to chart the course across the barren wasteland, following the battle plan. A long right-hand swing down into the north and center of Kuwait. To their left, the French and Americans had continued pushing deep into Iraq itself. They too were largely unopposed. In the distance, the prisoners began turning up in larger and larger numbers as Iraq's military crumbled away. Everywhere, the wreckage of their army. The British destroyed 200 Republican Guard tanks, losing none themselves. Some had lucky escapes, though. The crew of this reconnaissance tank escaped unhurt when an American plane mistakenly attacked them. Then came tragedy. The Desert Rats heard that nine British soldiers, the youngest 17, died when another American plane hit a warrior vehicle. We moved about 30 metres away in the wagon, uh, waiting for the guns to be blown. And there was just a mass explosion which blows back in the turret. And then when we looked out and seen the wagon had been hit, we moved round in front of the wagon to help with the casualties. We took a knock yesterday. You're all grown men. You're all soldiers. And we go on. I'm very proud of you last night. It didn't seem to affect what we did in the slightest. So thank you very much indeed. Across Kuwait's southern border, the Americans stormed through the sand defense walls the Iraqis had thrown up. They proved no protection at all as the 1st and 2nd US Marine divisions raced into the Emirate. behind a pipe fascine. Its pipes fill up anti-tank ditches in seconds, allowing backup armor to cross. AH-64 Apache attack helicopters. These were the machines that proved so deadly effective in knocking out tanks and other Iraqi vehicles in close combat. The 229th Aviation Brigade destroyed 50 Iraqi tanks in a single encounter. Aptly named Hellfire missiles, yeah. which enabled the Apaches to tear through armor cladding after skimming across the desert to find their targets. The Apaches had been involved in the very first actions of the war. Now they'd be involved in the last. Artillery duels developed. But once more, US firepower proved overwhelming. <laughs> Mech 
mechanized infantry poured rapidly across the border, with Kuwaiti advisors aboard to guide their American liberators across the featureless terrain. America's most modern tank, the M1 Abrams, able, like the British Challenger, to fire on the move. This was deployed to take on three Republican Guard divisions, each numbering up to 14,000 men and armed with the Soviets' latest T-72 tanks. As the desert rats were finding, the T-72 shells could do little more than dent these machines. On the other hand, hundreds of Iraqi tanks were shattered. It had been less of a battle, more a massacre of machinery. Coalition leaders were now certain of ultimate victory. We are continuing to attack and continue to achieve tremendous success against the Iraqi forces in the KTO. The coalition attack continues to meet with success on the ground, in the air, and at sea. The battle is going extremely well. It has taken our regiments only 36 hours to neutralize an enemy division. The key role of retaking Kuwait City itself went to the Arab forces. Saudis, Omanis, Egyptians, Syrians, men from the Emirates, and above all, Kuwait itself. The Kuwaiti forces, like their Iraqi oppressors, were equipped with the latest Russian tanks, the T-72s. As they dashed across the desert wastes, they were understandably delighted as resistance crumbled and retaking their homeland became merely a matter of time. As the Allies pressed forward, the trickle of Iraqi surrenders turned into a flood as thousands gave themselves willingly into Allied hands. They poured out of their foxholes, almost pitiful in their relief at being able to give up after the long nightmare of bombardment. Iraqi officers had told their conscripts they'd be shot if the Allies captured them, and they were obviously terrified this would happen. Allied soldiers were at pains to calm them. As the captives in their thousands were taken away, smoke columns could be seen on the horizon, burning oil installations. This was the first evidence of Iraq's horrendous scorched earth campaign as its forces fell back. Everywhere, jets of flame blasted into the skies the ultimate act of spiteful vengeance. The flames of Kuwait's oil wealth turning into plumes of smoke, which in turn became clouds of poison. Over 600 oil wells either left spewing crude into the air or set ablaze 